Zach is the creator of the popular webcomic Saturday Morning Breakfast Serial, and he also works on several other creative projects, including a fake lecture series show called The Festival of Bad Ad Hoc Hypotheses, or BAFest. He's also the author of the delightfully feminist children's book, Augie and the Green Knight. I got him to sign my copy earlier today. I highly recommend you look into it. If you're not familiar with Saturday morning breakfast cereal comics, uh, you should know that it addresses a diversity of themes, but especially many different branches of science. In fact, there are comics on just about every topic ever researched here at Beacon, including genetics, genomes, natural selection, sexual selection, evolutionary algorithms, genetic programming, artificial intelligence, game theory, robotics, bacteria, the microbiome, animal behavior, post-parasite dynamics, and cognition. I'll be talking today about a new theory about the origin of sexual reproduction. Um, after his talk, there will be a lengthy question and answer session in which you're encouraged to ask him anything. Um, he's also interested in talking about outreach to the public, so start thinking about what you want to talk to him about. I'd like to um, end, end my introduction with a little anecdote about the long period of time I've known Zach. It's been what, like a month since we started this book. Um, <laughs> so Charles Afria and I are both big fans of Zach's work, and for at least five years now, the earliest email I could find was 2011, uh, we have regularly said to each other, you know, we really need to invite him to come speak at Beacon. But we always ended up saying, no, he, he won't want to come. He's too big and important. This event isn't a big, big enough deal. Uh, he probably won't even answer our email. But on January 10th of this year, while we were in the midst of initial planning for this event, that day's SNBC comic was about Rich Lenski. <laughs> and early that morning, I received an email from Charles that read, Hey, Eric and Danielle, we've discussed before inviting Zach Wiener, creator of SNBC, to Rich's party, but weren't sure if he'd be interested. Given today's comic, mind if I go ahead and do that? And then he put a winky face emoticon. <laughs> My very hastily sent response from my cell phone was very eloquent, if unpronounceable, I'll try. Um, 17 exclamation points, um, an at symbol, I think my finger slipped, and nine more exclamation points. That's all I said. <laughs> that afternoon, Charles did send a very kind and formal invitation to Zach. Six hours later, Zach Wienersmith responded to us. He said, Sorry for the slow reply, <laughs> but I had to confirm it with my wife. I am in. So I'm very excited that this event has brought us together, and I'm delighted to present to you Zach Wainersmith. Uh, thank you for that embarrassing introduction. Um, my name is Zach Wainersmith. I draw a comic called Saturday Morning Breakfast Serial. Um, I guess I can skip the first part of my talk. Um, uh, so I'm not a real scientist. Uh, I'm not even a fake scientist. Um, so I am talking to you entirely because I made fun of uh, Rich Lensky. I'll give you a moment. Um, so uh, Charles saw the comic and uh, got in touch with me uh, about speaking of Dr. Lensky's 60th birthday. And uh, as I usually do in these matters, I confirmed that he didn't think I was the XKCD guy. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he was disappointed. <laughs> but uh, I already had my honorarium by then, so here I am. Um, and I'm happy to be here, and I'm mainly happy to be here because my wife, uh, Kelly Wienersmith, is a biologist, and uh, marriage is a war of attrition, and I'm currently winning. <laughs> because I have been invited as a cartoonist to a biology conference, but she has never been invited to a cartooning conference. <laughs> and I didn't even have to get a PhD, and I'm here, so I don't know why she did that. <laughs> anyway, so on to the matter at hand. Uh, as I said, my wife is a biologist, so I know from her that a question biologists ask all the time is, why do we ever have sex? Uh, and, thanks. <laughs> so, um, sex is an evolutionary puzzle. Um, why, why do we have sexual reproduction? It has so little going for it. It takes time, it takes energy, it's awkward, it's sticky. 
Um, adults do it, but that's because we're programmed by evolution uh, to believe we like it. But if you talk to pre-sexual adolescents um, who are in the best position to be dispassionate about these things, they're all disgusted by it. Um, and sexual reproduction, this is the nub of the matter, uh, means your offspring are only half as valuable to you as they could be. Um, and as with all things in biology, this goes all the way back to Darwin, and we know that Darwin knew about kin selection because he married his first cousin. <laughs> um, so Darwin, uh, it, with his kids, actually had an R of 0.5625, uh, which means he loved his children 0.0625 more than your parents loved you. <laughs> Uh, so, why did sexual reproduction evolve? Well, there are a couple theories, and they're all wrong and stupid. Uh, some people say this, uh, that sex evolved because of the benefits of sharing good mutations, but this is clearly absurd, and I can prove it by superimposing Angelina Jolie's good mutations with Brad Pitt's mutations, and we get this. <laughs> It's actually really hard to make that ugly. Um, there's another theory that sex evolved because of the benefits of new phenotypes, but this is also obviously false. If you consider the last time um, you went to the barber to get a new phenotype, um, do you think it made you more or less fit? <laughs> Um, another theory is that sex helps us battle parasites, um, but this is the most ridiculous theory of all, I think, because if that were true, you'd have to believe this scenario. <laughs> so, once I disproved all these silly theories, uh, that cleared out a space for new thinking. And we know the philosophy of science tells us a lot of good new theories come from analogy. We know one thing works, then we use that knowledge to understand how other things work. So biology example is we know that you can describe how a bouncy ball moves with a differential equation, and so we reason you can describe the entire future and pass all the energy in a single ecosystem in the same way. Oh, that's just proven. Uh, basically the same. Um, so I tried to think of things that are analogous uh, to the evolution of sex. Um, evolution of sex seems unlikely. Uh, in fact, it seems like a miracle it even occurred in the first place, and this led to my big insight. There are times in human life when sex also seems unlikely. In fact, it even seems like a terrible idea, and then it happens anyway. Um, so, um, this was my big insight. I call it Wiener Smith's dictum. Uh, and this is me to an entirely new model for the evolution of um, sexual reproduction, which I call it Sunday night around 9.45. <laughs> Um, this theory has a lot more predictive power than those old theories. Uh, it tells us that um, on the night sex evolved, there was probably nothing on TV. Uh, sex probably evolved very quickly because nobody had had sex in a long time. Um, there, there were probably no children awake uh, when sex evolved. Um, and uh, the theory suggests also that sex probably evolved in the evening, um, but we can't rule out the possibility that a couple of eukaryotes met up at a hotel on lunch break to evolve sexual reproduction. Um, <laughs> um, the theory also predicts how um, the early development of sex uh, would have evolved after it developed. Um, we think probably early on it was frequent and elaborate, and then later settled into a sort of once a month, who might as well do this sort of thing. Um, and the Tree of Life actually confirms this. If you look at the very primitive early uh, leopard slug, I have a description from Wikipedia. Uh, the leopard slugs uh, court usually for hours, circling and licking each other. And after this, the slugs will climb into a tree or other high area and then entwine together, lower themselves on a thick string of mucus, evert their white translucent mating organs, and so on. Uh, and I have literally never even considered anything that elaborate. <laughs> and then if you look at the most advanced species of all, of course, the bonobo, uh, sex is basically their version of a high five. Um, now, the one objection we could think of, the only objection to this theory, uh, is that there are a number of uh, more recent species that do have elaborate uh, mating displays. Uh, 
and, uh, or behavior, let's say. And um, this actually fits into our bigger theory because what's happening is it's just evolutionists trying to sort of, as it were, spice things up after so many years of sexual reproduction. Um, so in general, uh, just as it has over human time, over evolutionary time, sex has gone from this complicated ritual to kind of just a way of reminding other people you exist, or as Ernst Haeckel might have put it, debauchery recapitulates phylogeny. <laughs> <laughs> Like, like I was saying, it's always easier right when you're learning something, um, and 
it kind of depends on how dorky the field is. Uh, and what, dorky's the wrong word, I mean like what the barrier to entry to understanding is. So like, I, I kind of got into economics for a while, I'm still enjoying that, and uh, economics because it's about humans, it's pretty easy to, for everyone to get. Evolution's kind of that way too. Uh, like biology is very horizontal, there's a lot of broad knowledge. Um, I guess that's less true here where a lot of you are doing computational stuff. Um, but like, I, I, I would, like for a project I was reading a lot about quantum computing and there's just kind of no way I could do a joke about that. I would have to set up like 14 things to just, just sort of get through there. Um, but I think that's why a lot of cartoonists are more into like biology uh, jokes and that sort of thing because it's kind of easy. Everyone gets the basic idea. I think they might have a little wrong, but they get the basic idea. But yeah, if you want to write jokes, do it when you're learning it. Don't do it after you've been studying for 30 years. It's, uh, it's much harder, I think. So what is the dorkiest scientific field? The dorkiest scientific field? Oh man, I don't, uh, computational biology. It's the hardest. <laughs> I don't know how anyone does it. It's incredible. Um, I, I don't know. I, I, by, dorky was just the wrong word. I mean, you mean like like the population that studies the field? I'll let you answer. Let you. <laughs> uh, I think the, the rate of, of dorkitude is probably pretty high in computer science. I hate the stereotype. Um, keep digging, keep digging. Keep digging. <laughs> uh, I'll leave it there. I'm good. Just, uh, before I get more trouble yet. So I don't want to ask a question on the public speaking. You did a great job. Thank you. I, I have to assume that um, coming to a room full of people who are incredibly educated with the other and then presenting has to be somewhat stressful or, or perhaps not. Well, how many of you are incredibly educated by show of hands? <laughs> <laughs> It's really not so bad. Um, um, you know, honestly, I, I, I think I've improved a bit um, uh, because we do these, uh, as, as Charles was mentioning, we do these fake shows, fake lecture series, mostly on biology, actually. Um, and uh, like the, the show we do at MIT, about, I think last time we did it, 1,200 people came, so it's just this giant room of like, like to, like the nerdiest people in life, uh, and uh, like I did the first time we did, I did a joke about like eddy currents in aviation, and people like I, I still remember this. Like there were a bunch of people who laughed. A, a they laughed. I mean that was weird enough. But then there were people who were like, yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, and, and this was in the context. This is, I was explaining how babies are aerodynamic, uh, and, so I, and and so I, I think they were actually thinking about how it would work if you catapulted a baby. Uh, well, I mean, I could get off track. But, um, but yeah, I don't know. I, 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 I don't have too much stage fright, so it's not so bad. But I have, I have had the opportunity to do this a lot of times, so it's not too bad. Yeah? Uh, I was just going to say, from your reception here, it should be really clear that evolutionary scientists are clearly the coolest scientists. The coolest? <laughs> By far. I gotta think about that. <laughs> the social scientists dress better. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, they're working for those finance jobs. Uh, it's true. I mean, you guys dress the best. So I was just kidding. <laughs> Anybody else? Right there? So, how did you get into specializing in geeky humor? Uh, it's a funny story. So, I um, in another life, I, I had a literature BA. That's a uh, that's uh, my uh, original training. I'm, I got a literature BA, and I didn't know what to do with my life, um, and I got into the Hollywood entertainment business. And I actually, we were talking about this yesterday. I worked for the studio that later would be the creators of Sharknado. Um, <laughs> I know. I worked with it before they were big. <laughs> but uh, I kind of, I kind of inched my way up the Hollywood ladder until I had like a job working for talent agents, and um, that was pretty miserable. Uh, I don't, I don't wish death on anyone, but I would like them to be hurt. Um, not badly, I don't, you know, that sounds bad, but like, maybe stub their toe every day at the same time. <laughs> but it was, it was totally miserable, and so my outlet became drawing comics, um, and uh, this is a little bit truncated, but essentially what happened is I was, I was able to quit my job, comics were going okay, and I came into a little money, so I quit my job, and I found I had a lot of trouble writing, I think, because life was pretty good. At that time, I, like, I was 24 and I didn't have to work, um, and so I... Again, this is a short version, but I kind of I went back to school and eventually to get a degree in physics, um, which I did not complete because of comics. Uh, most people don't have a second chance to drop out. Um, but I, um, I I did it explicitly to get more sort of stress in my life. I figured that was a sort of productive way to be stressed out all the time. Uh, so I guess that's what all of you were doing. Uh, uh, 
but so I, I, I kind of by accident stumbled into science comics. I mean, I guess I was just I was interested in science just because I was interested in it. But I never I don't think there was ever a point at which I was trying to like educate people or spread the word about science. It's just interesting stuff to me. So it kind of just happened by accident, I guess. Yep. Do you use good news websites or atrocious news websites for inspiration? News websites like science. Science. Yeah. science. Uh, I am kind of like I was like uh, born at age 100. I, I don't really like the news. It's very it's very low information density, isn't it? Um, I do like I like sites like Fizz.org. It's pretty good, you know, just for getting dorky stuff. But I mostly try to read books um, and sort of thing. I don't know. I, I, for me, that's more enjoyable. Uh, yeah, sorry. I, uh, I don't have a good answer for that one. Yeah. So sometimes you pick some someone any topics for your comments. Yeah. So, what which of your comments has uh, sparked the most backlash? Oh man, uh, see, you're, you're putting me in a bad position where I'm going to have to admit to things. Um, <laughs> uh, I actually have had very little backlash. I mean, I, when I do like a, I used to I don't get this as much. I used to when I would do a joke about creationists, someone would send me an angry email or um, something like that. But I, I didn't get too much. I don't know if the internet is more stratified now and people just go to their own people, but. Um, I get very little hate mail. I do now that I, I have had times where I got something like a little wrong in quantum mechanics. Like I, uh, I once said you could use. I didn't say you could do it. I had characters doing it. They were using um, quantum stuff for uh, superluminal communication, which is against the law. Um, so, uh, so they, they got mad at me about that. But I don't, I don't get too much hate mail. I don't know. It's been disappointing. Your recent book. I don't know if you want to pitch it. The the, the one we were talking about. Oh, okay. So. I wrote a book called Religion Ruining Everything Since 4004 BC. Um, <laughs> but in fairness, the, the previous book was called Science Ruining Everything Since 1543. Um, so it's it more of a theme. And we, we actually addressed that because I, I actually, I, I don't, I, it's not my goal to anger people. I really don't try to. I make fun of like, I make fun of creationism, but not religion per se. Typically, you know, it's a whole different universe to me. It's like uh, actively illogical thinking. I don't want to get a fight about this one. <laughs> but uh, anyway, yeah. So I haven't got much hate now. Yeah. What's your favorite and least favorite part of your job? Um, oh, man. Uh, well, favorite is not having to work normal people hours. Uh, that's pretty good. It also, it means you know, we, we have um, a kid in love too soon. And it means I get to be home a lot, which is nice. Um, so being able to be flexible is really cool. Uh, and I, but, um, what's really great, actually, is um, this is actually kind of the best and worst thing. For me, I'm not, I know people can just come up with ideas uh, easily, and it's not easy for me. I don't feel anyway. So, what I try to do as I consider this my job, is I read a lot of books. I, I read, if I'm being good, something like three to five books a week, just as fast as I can, because I, I feel like my job is to be, you know, to know things that other people don't know and talk about them, which is good because, uh, you know, it keeps me on my toes and I get to learn lots of neat things and I don't have to do jobs that aren't uh, stimulating. In fact, almost all the work I do is, is mental work. Um, but it's also bad because it's kind of like nonstop. Because uh, I, I do, I put out a comic every day, and so it's it's um, it's like an everyday stress. I never stop thinking about it. It's kind of the general any kind of freelance work job is like you're away from work, but you're always at work. Um, so that's the hardest part. Yeah. Yeah. So you uh, mentioned uh, on a good week you're reading three to five books a week. How do you pick those books, especially when you go into a new field? How do you know what's good, and then do you read a lot of newer old things? Um. Uh, um, mostly it's organic. I, I often, you, you start reading a book and then they'll mention other books or other topics and then you find books on those topics and you branch out. Um, other times with, with the field, like I think I got into economics um, and I happen to know a couple of people who are in economics. The nice thing about doing nerd comics is you just meet random people and so I was able to write me like, you know, what's the default macro textbook and, and so then I just picked it up and, and read it. Um, in terms of age of stuff, yeah, I, I don't read a lot of super current stuff, especially with fiction um, and that's mildly to do with sheer snootiness, um, but it's also just, I, I, like, I don't read a lot of comics in general, I, I don't want to be imitating, I think that's sort of, you know, obviously you're all scientists, you have to be reading the current stuff, but for me, like, I don't want to be reading exactly what people are doing right this second, because I don't want to be copying the sort of general uh, artistic movement right now, so um, I do read a lot of old books. Uh, yeah. uh, what's the best book you've read in the last, uh, like, six months or a year? Um, what genre? Uh, or just matter. in general, um, the best, my favorite book, this might be a little beyond six months, but there's a wonderful book, it's an author named Beryl Markham, and she wrote exactly one book. Uh, it's called West of the Night. Uh, it was about, um, well, let me not give it away, uh, but um, I found it because it 
speaking of organic um, reading, uh, I was reading a book of letters by Ernest Hemingway, and there's this passage where he says something like, there's this woman named Beryl Markham, and she makes us all look like fakes. Uh, she's so good. Uh, and so I got the book, and it's, it's that good. Um, I understand there's some debate over authorship, but I think that might just be because uh, when you know, someone just writes one perfectly good book and nothing else, you get really mad. Um, so, but yeah, West with the Night is one of the best books I've ever read. Uh, and it's uh, fiction. Uh, in terms of nonfiction, if I may, there's, there's um, an incredibly good nonfiction book, which mysteriously is out through CRC Press. Um, and uh, probably should talk smack about CRC Press. But, um, uh, by Jonathan Dowling, who I believe is at LSU. It's called uh, Schrodinger's Killer App. It's a, it's about um, the, the the killer app is Shor's algorithm. If anyone's into this stuff, but um, it's about quantum computing. It's just this sort of like sprawling 500 page, gets you just barely to understand quantum computing. And, but it's just incredibly well written, and, and he's got a lot of funny anecdotes from his own life. He had this really good story. Just if I can, he had this great story about the. Um, Quantum computing is funded a lot by military people because of the um, encryption issues. Uh, uh, which, if, if you don't know, the, the, the RSA encryption algorithm, algorithm, which is the algorithm that encrypts pretty much everything, would probably be broken by a working quantum computer with not too many bits, qubits. Um, and so, but anyway, so he had the story that he was talking about general, I think it was, and uh, he was talking about this thing in math called the Chinese remainder theorem. And the general had been like halfway sleeping for the whole time. Suddenly perks up and he's like, "What's that? The Chinese remainder theorem?" Uh, he says, uh, you know, are the Chinese ahead of us on this? <laughs> and uh, I forget when the actual theorem was created, it was like in the year 600 or something. And so he was like, yes, the Chinese are far ahead of us on the Chinese remainder theorem. And apparently the general like, had his secretary like, write that down, you know? Um, so it's a lot of stories like that and also quantum mechanics. And like, it, it's not up for a major publisher. Right? And, um, and, it, it, and you see the marks of that. It's not super edited, but it's just a wonderful book beginning to end. So I have to recommend it. Yeah, uh, way back there. Having worked so far and being so successful, do you think comedy and satire is an effective way to reach out to the non scientific public? Or do you think much of your audience is you know, scientists and people who want to do the science? I don't know. I, I think I have an especially curmudgeonly view of that question because so everyone in comedy believes they're making social change. I don't think there's very good evidence of that. Um, I mean, there could be. Uh, um, you know, I mean, I think you partially believe that because it makes you feel good, like I'm, I'm making a difference. I don't know. I mean, I, it would be very hard. I can say this here because it's a room full of nerds. It would be very hard to dis no offense. Um, it would be very hard to disentangle that from the opposite, which is like there's a social trend and I'm just reflecting it, um, and that's why it's popular. Like, so, so th there are all these examples in history where like X TV show came out and that suddenly made endurance for this rights movement, but you have no way to determine that it wasn't the other way around. It could have been that civil people were receptive and that's why the show was popular. Um, so I'm, I'm sort of very dubious of this idea of entertainers as as major change makers. Maybe I'm wrong. I would like to be wrong, but I don't know. Um, I do think in terms of explaining things, humor is good. It kind of takes the edge off things. But I think in, in general, at least this is my view, is you're better off talking to an individual than trying to motivate a giant group of people because you don't know how you're being received. Yeah? I'm curious what the economics of being a web comics producer. You know, it, everyone from that. Yeah. It's, really, I, it's, it's interesting. Actually, now a guy who wrote his master's on it. Um, so you can write a master's on anything, um, <laughs> um, but uh, it, it varies. But uh, essentially, and this changes over time. Uh, uh, but most people are independent actors. Uh, most people are running a very like a micro business. A couple will get to where they're running a slightly bigger one. I think I'm somewhere in between. Um, partially, I don't, I don't want to run a large business. That sounds horrible. But um, but uh, you just have uh, like any business, you have different revenue streams. We sell advertising, like books, merchandise, we do uh, events, that sort of thing. Um, and what, what's interesting, actually, I suppose this might be interesting from a, something like a, a social science standpoint, is what's happened lately now that there's more money is communities are developing in a way they didn't exist before. So it might be, you know, it used to be all the cartoonists were under a syndicate that was run by newspapers, and that went away kind of, I mean, it still exists, but as a sort of residually exists. Um, whereas all the young cartoonists publish online, and now they're starting to form into groups. So these old institutions are kind of reforming, but created by new people. So they're now these sort of consortia of uh, cartoonists who share resources uh, to get things done. So um, there's a lot to it, uh, but but it, yes, you can make a living at it. I, I, I'm wildly overpaid, uh, so it's a pretty good deal. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so how often do you come up with ideas? For Clever, side there too dirty. And as a follow-up, you thought about doing a little bit of these for this. <laughs> the, the ones that push it too far? 
I, uh, I don't know that that's ever happened. Um, I, I actually had, I had a discussion with a friend early on. I mean, this was like, oh, five or six years ago. Um, and I was talking with him. I, I don't remember what the comp was, but I had some idea. And I was like, I don't know. It, it might be just sort of too nerdy. It's like asking too much of the audience, which is something you, you, know, you don't want to overdo. But he said something that, I, you know, I, I don't usually hinge on something someone says, but he said, you know, well, if you, if you don't expect something of your audience, that's, you're setting a different standard. So I thought, oh, that's a good point. You know, so I, I, um, I mean, I do, you know, I, I don't want to do a joke that's so involved. You have to, like, look up eight Wikipedia references to know what's going on. But, like, uh, but generally speaking, I'm, I'm willing to push stuff. I also, I, I have the benefit of doing daily comics. So if I, if I put out a nerdy joke and it just dies, like, I cover it up the next day. We pretend it didn't happen. <laughs> yeah. To jump off that, yep. do you track the, like, uh, which comics go viral, or what traffic is like? Uh, you know, uh, so my wife does statistics for biology. We've talked about doing that in a more detailed way. I think it would be really interesting, actually, but we, I, I mean, I have, like, a, a sort of mental track that could probably be put into an Excel sheet or something, but so, like, this is interesting, though. I did, I did run a sort of little mini experiment on myself, which means it was what's less than single blind, zero blind. It was not blind at all. But, um, but so I... Um, I had written out scripts for like, I don't know, a week or two, and then I put a, 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 like a grade point assignment next to it. Like, and the grade point was how well do I think this will do, like so A or B or C or what have you. And, and my metric for how it will do, which is probably what I'd use if I were trying to do it properly, was like how many like, retweets, how many Facebook likes, how many how, like, extra traffic to the site, et cetera. And I found I had literally no predictive ability. Like comics <laughs> that I thought would die did great, ones I thought were brilliant just did not. Um, and that could just mean that the, my metric was like just showing like not the right metric and it was you know it was random, but because you're not measuring how much people like in their hearts enjoy the comic, or, <laughs> right? So so just to, to put something concrete on that, like I'm sure if I did a joke about Batman, it would get more retweets by virtue of having Batman in it, right? So that's not you know the metric's a little fuzzy, but yeah, but I, I was I was kind of disappointed. I think I could I could probably like pick which script should eventually become comics a little better than random, but maybe, not as much as I thought. I was, I was a little disappointed. Um, so uh, I think you could probably, we, we talked about doing this someday, like you could probably come up with something and say like, have something like an advanced focus group, I know some economists look into this where you have like, you find people who are very good at predicting who will like a joke about X, and then use those people to classify a script into whether you should do it or not. But you see the problem is eventually you've got like a team of 800 people in order to like tell a butt joke, uh, and, um, and you're not in a good position in, in life, I think. Uh, there's some other question back here. How did you run across Rich Lenski's work? I made fun of him. It was, uh, I, oh, how I ran across his work? Oh, yeah. well, he's a legend. <laughs> I don't, uh, Why did it take you so long? I know. <laughs> <laughs> I was just working up the nerve. <laughs> um, I don't I think probably, you know, in the bacteria thing, I think it's in popular news like perennially, so I think it probably just bumped into it at some point. Um, there was someone back here. But, yeah. So have you ever had other groups or scientists reach out to us for insulting comics? Oh yeah, yeah. I've, I've made a lot of friends by insulting them in comic form. Uh, <laughs> but I actually just um, uh, I, I just got to speak at there's a big economics conference called AEA. I think it's Jesus. I didn't look that up. Um, that thing. My brother would never do that. See? I have evidence. I have, yeah. Um, so I actually did kind of similar thing there, the fake theory of economics, um, which therefore was more plausible, I guess. Um, <laughs> boom! Uh, uh, but I don't know, it's fun. So I, I, I used to do comic conventions like I should, but, but uh, like I said, we have a, a toddler at home, so I, I really cut down on the stuff I do. Uh, just uh, stuff like this, you know, is it, much less time intensive than running a, a convention booth or something. So yeah, I do stuff like this a lot more now. I expect an invitation from John Dowling, that he's a good friend of mine, and I just tweeted that you like the book so much. It's, it's probably, and I, since you got him, uh, it's, it's probably literally the best nonfiction I've ever read. It's, it was like one of the, you know, like, like I consider a, a nonfiction book to be good if it changes your view on something. He, he's a funny guy. He's, he must be. He's, he's great, yeah. And he's handsome, too. He's really. <laughs> No, I, you know the promise is nice. Um, <laughs> no, um, no, we actually know each other. We, uh, yeah, I mean, we don't like hang out on weekends and go windsurfing together, but like, you know, we, 
like Webcomics is a really small community. It, it's gotten big over time, but there's like, maybe 100 people who, who can make a living at it, and so we kind of all know each other, because um, one of the benefits of, of us all being islands, as I was describing earlier, like we're all independent businesses, is it's, there's not a lot of risk to sharing information. Um, so we all sort of uh, help each other out, it's, uh, except for the jerks, but I won't tell you who those people are. Um, but so we all help each other out, and so yeah, he's, he's very nice. I don't actually really get confused with him very often. I just, uh, it's become like a running joke, so I have to tell it. Um, yeah. Yeah? Uh, in that same vein, I was wondering, um, you mentioned not needing to any other comics, but uh, among the, let's say, 100 people who do web comics, do you notice any sort of common background among the people who are in Like background in, uh, in terms of, oh, in terms of their science interests? Yeah. Um, I actually think it's changing. Uh, you know, I think the first web comic was in like 1993 or something, and the early stuff was necessarily really nerdy because the kind of person who was on the internet in 1993, probably a lot of people here, um, <laughs> uh, you know, not, not just a random person was on the internet in 1993. Um, and so the, the early comics were really, really nerdy. I think the, the most popular ones were like video game or um, like science-y, dorky stuff. And, uh, I should consider it a sign of success, I suppose, although it's a little sad to see it happen, is that the popular comics now are a bit more mainstream, kind of regular people comics. Um, and, and actually, I mean, this, this has been a weird experience. Like, now there are, like, I have friends who teach web comics, which we used to feel like they were very rebellious, and now they're, they're teaching at universities, and, like, uh, so they sold out, you see. Um, uh, but, um, yeah, so I think it's changed. I mean, it it's kind of makes sense that if, if web comics are a, a mainstream medium, then they should reflect the mainstream. So the average uh, comicer is not nearly as nerdy as they used to be. But we're still out there, you know? Uh, yeah. Yeah? One of the things that I've noticed about the web comics, and Mo does this, we've done this a little bit, is that because you're not tied to the uh, yeah. page space and so on, you have flexibility with regard to the panels and so on. So, can you say something about how form is evolving by virtue of Yeah, yeah, so um, if you go back 100 years, uh, you can look at what it used to be like to do cartoons. It used to be like a much a much higher paid job, but also like a more respected job, probably because there's no TV to watch. Um, and you can look, like, if you look up a guy named Windsor McKay, uh, he's this person everyone in comics uh, knows, and he used to get a whole broadsheet to draw one comic. You know, this would go out in the newspapers. You could, you could frame every single one of these. Um, and then what happened over time is probably because comics got less popular or editors got stingier, um, they slowly got smaller until I think in the 80s Bill Watterson was complaining that comics had basically become little tiny boxes with little heads saying things in them. And it's kind of true. Uh, there's not a lot of room to let your creativity roam. And then this guy named Scott McCloud is kind of like the guy in, I guess you'd call something like comics literary theory. Uh, I don't know if there's a term for it. but. Uh, but he wrote a sort of famous book called um, Understanding Comics, uh, which is, 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 is it's good enough that even if you don't care even a little about that idea, you should read because it just has a book quite good. And he um, he proposed this thing, I think it was in that book, called The Infinite Canvas, meaning like, well, once it's on a computer, you can do anything. And I think he proposed some stuff that's a bit too out there, like was not human friendly. Um, like, you know, we'll go way off to the side, and you'll have to read over here, and then you'll have to loop around, and it turns out nobody wants to read a comic that way. But um, but we, yeah, a lot of us, um, because you have infinite space, especially infinite um, uh, vertical space, um, yeah, you can you can do all sorts of stuff. So I used to only do single panels. Now now and then I, I do like 15 or 20 panel things on a single day. It's, it's really nice. And the only thing that's sad about it is you sort of wish like people like Bill Watterson could have done that because like none of us are as good as he is. There's some, some, some of the younger people that are quite good. Uh, you know, they're like institutions training them. But, uh, but no, it's true. They're better than us. We suck. Um, <laughs> But um, yes, yeah, so that's that's a big thing now. I, I um, not as big as maybe you would have thought because there is this built-in problem, which is uh, if you want to publish in book form, which you do because there's a good profit margin, you still have to have like a sensible shape to your comic. Like I, I know the oatmeal was saying, he had a hell of a time turning his stuff into a book form because he does these. You guys like this, like this all, you know. So it, it took a huge amount of time just to format it. So I actually think. Somewhat ironically, a lot of the younger, more experimental cartoonists are still saying, well, it eventually needs to be 9 by 7. Um, so it's complicated, I guess. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. Will you ever pay by an apprentice? An apprentice? Yeah. Oh, God. Uh, do I have to pay them? Um, <laughs> uh, I don't know. Well, I see, like I said, my wife is an academic, so I never live anywhere more than a week. Um, so, uh, 
So uh, that's not, not a possibility. I suppose I'd be open to it. But see, the problem is, like, with a science apprentice, you're like, let me show you the lab. Like, what I do is I sit and I read books, and I think I'm rather clever, and that's my job. Um, so, but I suppose I'd be open to talking to an intern or something once I live in the same place for more than 10 minutes. But, uh, but I don't know. Yeah. I mean, you know, my email is public. If you ever have a question about a comic thing, just email me. It's on my website. That's actually me. It's not like some pretend person. And you reply very quickly. I do. Uh, yeah, under six hours. Yeah. Um, so you have like a little red button on your website that reveals um, um, kind of hidden extra features of the comic, like a, a certain other web comic with alt text. Um, what proportion? I have alt text too. Yes. What proportion of your audience do you think knows about this functionality, and why do you um, uh, present it in that way? Yeah. So for people don't know. I, you know, I have a comic, but then there's this little button under it. If you click it, you get sort of like a little follow-up panel. Um, I uh, uh, I don't know how many people know, but I know like every time one of my comics gets posted somewhere, someone mentions it, and someone else is surprised and has to read a thousand comics to catch up. Um, <laughs> which which leads to the next thing, which is it's very good for business um, <laughs> because I, I don't know the actual numbers. But probably every time you load a page, I get some fraction of a penny uh, from advertising, you know. And so if you load three thousand, I get three thousand fractions of a penny, um, which is pretty good. Um, but it's actually also good. Uh, one one problem with doing art online is that very easy to steal your work. I almost hesitate to say steal because it, it like conveys it doesn't convey how easy it is. You know, you just put the, the URL somewhere. And so what the little red button does is it means if you want this other thing, it's a little harder to steal. You have to steal two images and like format them or something. So it's a very good way to induce people to come to the main site, which is where we can you know hawk things at them, make them look at advertisements. So yeah, oh I'm sorry, yeah, make a living. I mean, I can make my heart earn living. Um, <laughs> I'm doing a bad job. Yeah. Um, anybody else? Uh, yeah. So you're really great about showing a diversity of genders and sexual orientations and like having that be a completely normal thing in your comics. Has the response to that been mostly positive? I would say it's been really good. Um, in a way, almost disappointingly good. Uh, so I, I, I still remember, I think it was in 2010, and it occurred to me, probably quite late, but, I, but still nobody else seems to do it. And I thought, can I do a comic where I like, you know, I do a lot of comics with couples doing stuff, you know, could I do a comic that was like a, uh, two men, say, and just get away with not mentioning it? Because, um, you know, people will do like jokes and the characters are gay, but the joke always has a reference. If you have to call it out, which is like, you know, kind of weird uh, if you think about it. Um, and so I did it, and uh, it, the nice thing uh, uh, is that I, I did it, and I did get a lot of people saying, hey, this is great that you're doing this, I really appreciate it. And over time, I've gotten less of that, which is, is good for society. I think it suggests that you know, it's not a big deal anymore, and like lots of comics do it now. Uh, maybe not as many as it should, but, uh, but sorry. Either society is improving, or uh, people got fed up with me and left. I don't know. Um, but did I answer your question? I think. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah. No, so I do try to do that. Uh, I, I've actually repeatedly been asked if I have like a random gender generator or something. <laughs> or, but, but I just try to, in general, just sort of play against type is all I do. I don't have a, a system. Yeah. Did Rich do your Dwarvis lab and let you transfer the bacteria? No, I didn't get anything. <laughs> uh, no, it's, it's terrible. I could have put my finger in there, it would have been cool. <laughs> still time. Still time, I don't know if I you up, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah? Yes. Um, do you have any grand plans for the future, like something you want to do in 10 years, or some crazy comic idea that you're going to try out? I have several, but I can't tell you all of them. Uh, I have at least three projects. I can't mention anything, can I? I nothing moved yeah. out this Nothing moved out. Yeah, top secret. Yeah. 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 Um, or something you'd like to see done, even if it's not you. Wow, uh, man. I wish I could. I tell you the stuff we're working on. We have a lot of cool projects, but I just I have this sort of personal rule that I don't talk about stuff until it's definitely going to happen. I don't want to seem like a schmuck. Uh, but um, movie ideas. Movie ideas. Oh man, no. We did we did video stuff for a while. And it was brutal. Like two minutes of video is like a hundred people's hours. Forget it. It's never again. Uh, <laughs> not that it wasn't fun, and not that I wasn't proud of the product, but never again. Um, no, I mean I, I, I do. I, like so one thing. Uh, I, we still have a few of these for sale, as you mentioned. We, we did this Kickstarter for, I guess you call it a toy, called the Single Use Monocle. 
Um, the, the joke is, is it's like it looks like it's a condom, but you open it up, and it really is a monocle with like a chain and everything. So the idea is like you know you need some, you'd be a little more classy, um, so you pull this out of your wallet um, and you open it up. And, um, so, you, go, you go to singleusemonocles.com. Uh, they are available. Um, so we did this, and it's we did not make a lot of money because, as you might imagine, the supply chain is not already worked out <laughs> uh, in the way it is for books. But it was just like I do like sort of branching out and doing stupid stuff. Uh, so we do have another stupid project, which probably actually this room in particular would be very interested in, but I can't tell you what it is because it's not. We're, we're still, it involves biology. Biology is very finicky, it turns out. Um, but I, I mean, I'd be happy to talk to anyone like personally, but I just don't want to be declaring to a room and a camera. Yeah. what I'm working on, so, yeah. Uh, yeah? I would be curious in the mechanics of how you draw comics, like what sure. software you use, what tools you use, how long it takes you. Yeah, so I use, um, the, I pretty much use the most common stuff, uh, which is there's uh, a digital tablet company called Wacom. Uh, the, they make all sorts of levels of stuff, but I, I, I have a, like the one expensive thing I own is uh, what's called a Cintiq. It's just a large monitor you can draw directly on. Um, and I use a piece of software called, I think it used to be called Manga Studio, now it's Clip Studio, but it's it's basically, it's like Photoshop that doesn't cost $700. Um, and, uh, and it's also it's explicitly designed for comic stuff, like it includes like um, like uh, perspective stuff, like you can get perspective lines done automatically if you want to draw a room or something, little, little stuff cartoons care about, or like speech bubbles, that sort of thing. Um, and that's pretty much it. I, I Pretty much everyone like under the age of 25 Works almost exclusively digitally now. It's like like an instant change. Um, so like it's actually gotten to the point where I would say like uh, paper and ink or paper and paint media is kind of like a novelty. It's like a like a cool thing you might do, but everybody else is working digital, um, especially because it, people have worked out all the ways to imitate. Like you can you can imitate like oil painting now with, with digital stuff. It's it's kind of incredible. Um, I'm obviously not doing that. I just do little dirty jokes. Um, but but yeah, I think that's all the software I use. And we have like. Uh, Software for like managing the database and that sort of thing. That's not terribly interesting. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, yeah. Um, how are your comics licensed? Because I, I would love to be able to just fill all my lectures with them. You can you can use them all you want. Um, we're Creative Commons, uh, and frankly, I'm not super pleasy about stuff. I mean, if you were like selling it, then we might have to chat. But uh, <laughs> uh, but I think you know honestly, like if you had like a group, you wanted to put one of my comics on the shirts, and you're making like I, I think I, I can't actually say you're allowed to make money, but like you know it's just a little academic group. We're not going to come after you or anything. But but yeah, there's anything academic you're welcome to do, and even. Um, if you want to put it in, like, I just had a, a friend of mine actually put one of my comics in his thesis. Um, so anyone's welcome to do that. Uh, we, we draw the line of profit just for legal reasons. Um, but um, but even if you want, if you have like an academic press book, usually we charge like a token fee. Uh, so, yeah. yeah. Uh, so you you keep doing these festivals with that. Uh, yeah. Yes. I assume it's a little one of them is similar to the topic. Yeah, this is this is kind of in the same universe. Uh, what are, can you tell us some of your favorites? Your favorite bad ad hoc ad hoc? Favorite bad ad hoc? Yeah, probably, I don't want to say my favorite because I don't want to be mean to anyone, but one I really loved was by um, Sarah Hurd, who, uh, what are her credentials? She's like a, a real scientist. Someone knows Sarah Hurd, maybe? Yes, okay. Is this a professor at the University of Connecticut? Sarah Hurd, Dr. Hurd. Uh, Anyway, it turns out she's hilarious. Like, not not like no offense, not like science nerd funny, like actual funny. Uh, and uh, she gave this great talk. It was I think Buffest West, which is a San Francisco show. It was 2014, I think. And it was why do mammals sleep? And her argument was that um, there's a correlation between hours slept per day and how awful their lives are. Um, so she had this amazing graph that was like, of course, just lying through omission like crazy, but it was like, you know, giraffes apparently sleep like four hours a day or something. This is true. And then like possums who live in garbage and have to carry babies on their backs uh, sleep like 16 hours a day. Um, so she like had this really good correlation. She went through all these animals and like she even had this like, you know, the challenge is uh, koalas who don't sleep very much, but then she had, um, I forget what was hard about being koalas, like they have like three uteruses or something, so she's like, that's awful. Um, <laughs> oh, they do sleep long? Yeah. Do I get it wrong? Oh, because it's awful, yeah, yeah. So you try to get away from your awful three uterus life uh, <laughs> as, a, as a koala. Um, so that was, that was awesome. That was, not only was it very clever, but like, um, we didn't usually give points for it, but we really appreciate 
could be manipulation of data. I shouldn't say good, but like like abuse of data. We've actually talked about giving out an award for best abuse of data, um, but, uh, but we haven't done it yet. But that was that was a great one. Definitely, um, if you want to look one up, just look up Sarah Hurd's "Why Do Animals Sleep." It's very good. Anybody else? Yeah. I, I have a rule that I do write every day, but you know I, I do that because I might just have no good ideas one day. So, yeah. so it's it's more like an average of one a day. I mean, one goes up a day, but my like production per day is not one. It's it, it wobbles around. Yeah, yeah. I have a small buffer right now. I've been uh, burning for the project done. Yeah. Yeah. I, I guess off of that, how how long does one comic take from start to finish? Oh, yeah, yes, I didn't answer that. Um, like if it's a graph joke, it's like <laughs> three minutes. I don't know. Um, the the actual the, the main bottleneck for me is not the drawing time. I mean the very long ones. Like I've been sitting on this fifteen panel idea I have for for a while because I know it's going to take me like six hours to do or something. That, that's that's toward the maximum. Occasionally, if it's something really special, it'll take longer. But that's that's about the maximum. I think the average is probably more like an hour. Um, well, maybe more like two hours. I guess it, it really just depends. Um, but. Um, but the, the, the real time consumer is, is trying to read a lot uh, and spend a lot of time writing on the drawing. Yeah? Uh, what impact have you seen the kind of alternate content models like Kickstarter or Patreon? And kind of how in the field? Have you seen more comic artists as a result of this? Or? Have, have I seen more comic artists doing crowdfunding? Or, or just have, do you think that there's more money going into the field because of these alternative models where it's not just ad money or people selling books? But, I, I, I think probably, like, uh, so from my own perspective, I know our book launches via Kickstarter make so much more than when we just did it ourselves. Uh, Kickstarter has this weird psychological effect on humans where they, like, open their wallets uh, when they see it. I don't know what it is. Um, I think actually sort of Kickstarter makes everything feel like it's a party, like it's an event, it's a special thing that's happening, and people get excited. But it makes a big difference for us. Um, and 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 we're we're pretty robust in terms of having multiple revenue streams. So I imagine for smaller comics, it, it makes a really big difference. Um, but I, it's interesting. So actually, a, an interesting model that's popped up recently is called Patreon, and maybe some of you are familiar with it. But it's essentially it's crowdfunding, but it's more like what it reminds me of is there used to be in science. I don't know if some version of this still exists, but I remember reading. I think Joseph Priestley got money because he had a, what was called subscription, which was like you know, people agree to give you X dollars per unit time in exchange to get your papers when they come out. Um, and uh, Patreon is kind of that. Uh, it's like, uh, it, but micro, so it's like, you, I have a whole lot of people who agree to give me like a dollar minus some fees every time I, I put up uh, a month worth of comics. Um, and that's really changed things. Um, that, that's, that's been really, uh, it's really changed the, the system for all cartoons because it's, it's a stable form of income which was pretty much non-existent prior to that. It's, it's relatively stable. Um, so yeah, crowdfunding's made a big difference. I, I don't know like the overall economy of web comics. I don't know if anyone has numbers on that, but I think it's probably made a difference. I guess. Yeah. Anybody else? Have one more time. Maybe. Yeah. Okay. Go to the next person. Uh, five minutes early. Yeah. Uh, so last chance for any more questions.